Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today at our quarterly NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group meeting. Uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes here to let folks sign on. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to post a link to our running notes document here. Uh, so if you could head over to that notes document, there is a uh, an attendance section. Um, so it'd be great if you could write in your names under the attendance bullet point there. Uh, we have a September 12th meeting uh, section, which is uh, down on the starts on the third page. So wait one more minute. Yeah, let me paste that link in there just in, again, just in case it disappeared or isn't there for folks who are just joining. All right, well, I think we've got critical mass here. And um, yeah, Robin, do you want to, uh, do you need introductions initially? Well, I was thinking there's so many people on the call that I think could be new to the call. So maybe I won't put Zeke on the spot, um, but I will introduce him in chat. How's that? Yeah, it looks like we have um, several new members who've signed on just for the first time uh, for a meeting. So um, it's like uh, five folks at the moment. Yeah, we usually ask uh, new attendees to say a few words about themselves if they're open to doing that. Sure. If you want me to do that, I, I'm Kent Kerber. I'm from the University of Minnesota, and I manage part of managing our data repository uh, called Drum. So, look forward, looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thanks. Welcome, Kent. Um, let's see. Uh, is Michael there? Is it Dermody? Hello, yeah, uh, Michael Dermody, Digital Preservation Librarian at Syracuse University Libraries. Um, thanks for putting this on. I'm excited. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Um, and uh, let's see, Christina. Yeah, hi, I'm Christina Velasquez Fiddler. I'm the Digital Archivist at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. Thanks. All right, welcome. And um, Ema? Hi, yes, I'm Ema Odwok. Um, I'm with Texas Digital Library. I'm a digital librarian there and in a residency position. Thanks. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, let's see, Peter Gorman. Yeah, hi, uh, Peter Gorman, I'm Director for Digital Library and Preservation Strategy at UW Madison Libraries. I'm normally on the Standards and Practices group, but lurking here for this meeting today. Great, great, thank you. Thanks for joining us. All right, and Zeke, it looks like um, if, uh, Robin went ahead and introduced you in the chat there. Um, happy to have you uh, join us as well. And um, so let me go ahead and get things started here. Um, so today we are focusing on um, 
One of the most uh, upvoted topics that uh, came through our uh, annual poll for the group, which is research data sets and the storage strategies and requirements that are associated with them, um, what make those storage and infrastructure requirements uh, unique. And um, with us today, we, uh, we have Sam Gustman, uh, who is the Associate Dean for Technologies at USC Libraries. He's also the CTO of the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, he has put together a presentation for us um, about the USC Digital Repositories approach to providing preservation solutions for researchers that take into consideration the data management requirements of NIH, NSF, and other federally funded uh, research projects. Um, so we're going to spend some time um, uh, listening to Sam's presentation on that topic. And then um, we're hoping that folks have brought along all of their questions uh, regarding research data sets and storage and infrastructure for digital preservation. Um, I know that uh, there are many different aspects of um, preserving research data sets that are unique in terms of you know, sensitive data, in terms of uh, accessing um, different resources to use with those research data sets. Um, and of course, you know, actually the user experience um, of both depositing and retrieving and access. Um, there's so many different um, aspects to working with data sets um, and the crossroads of digital preservation with those is, um, is really, really interesting and um, definitely uh, what I've seen to be a very hot topic right now. So really glad that um, folks put that onto the poll for the year and um, really looking forward to this presentation. So. Um, Without any further ado, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Sam, and um, if you could go ahead and um, introduce yourself, actually, and uh, give us a little background and take it away. That'd be great. Uh, happy to. Do you want me to try and share my PowerPoint here first? Okay. Yeah. Let me do that. Let me know if you don't have access. That uh, looks good. Okay. Good. good, good. So, hi, everybody. Um, my name's Sam Gossman. Uh I've been the CTO of the USC Shoah Foundation for 29 years and the uh, Associate Dean and CTO of the USC Libraries for 14 years. Um, uh, the Shoah Foundation, for those who don't know what that is, uh, Shoah is the Hebrew word for the Holocaust. It's an organization that was started by Steven Spielberg after the movie Schindler's List to go around, spend $300 million going around the world interviewing the remaining Holocaust survivors. And then that expanded into a number of genocides. We're on our 15th genocide collection. Uh, it's natively about a 25 petabyte database compressed. It's about six petabytes at the moment. And um, that is one of the core things in infrastructures that were used to expand, to build a general digital repository for all of USC uh, to use regardless of collection or type. So, um, and, and, and everything that I'm gonna say here today, you can find on our website at uh, repository.usc.edu. Um, so uh, if there's something that you wanna share or send to somebody, uh, these are the things that we do. Um, I thought I'd start with sort of generally what we do is an overview in the digital repository and then move towards uh, the details around uh, the data management plans. Um, so let me do that. So again, uh, the USC digital repository is actually a partnership between the central IT group at the university, the libraries, and the use started using the Shoah Foundation's uh, technologies to provide everything from uh, collection services through uh, digitization, then preservation, cataloging, uh, and and access to large uh, collections of interest to the university. We currently have over sixty petabytes and growing of of managed content in the uh, archive. So uh, again, these are the kinds of services in general that we offer, um, uh, digital preservation, digitization. Uh, we have our, our uh, supercomputer center here and we've got um, about 15 petabytes of high-speed disk attached to that. That is the front-end cache to 
the larger preservation archive for people to be able to do work on. Um, we have other kinds of services that uh, help um, with people getting information, but we've also recently started getting into um, Web3 preservation services because people, as they start to identify content, want to identify provenance of that content and rights of that content and the Web3 storage like Filecoin, which is at an 18 exabyte infrastructure at the moment, provide the ability for groups that are in journalism and in other areas where they have to prove where their materials actually came from uh, along with fixity and when it was taken, uh, not just from the camera to preservation to access, that, that starts to enable some things. I won't go too deep into that because it doesn't really affect a lot of the NIH data management plan, but that's a new area for us. Um, some of our, we've got a, a dozen departments at the university that are, are um, contracting. And one of the things I was asked to talk about was how we do um, revenue recovery on the work that we do. Um, we don't have a budget where we ask the university per se to support the digital repository and then do work for the university at large. We have a cost menu of services and various departments and other, or if there are people in departments that want others to use our service because they're interested in access to those collections, they can. So for example, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines uh, are, are processing for preservation a, a 250 petabyte archive of, of information on all of the moving images and imagery that they've ever collected that's meant for the public to use. Um, we have a pretty large cinema school and Warner Brothers uses us as a cloud target for all their TV and film. That's a, a little over 30 petabytes of data at the moment. In general, our infrastructure, and I'm still at the general level here. Um, in general, what we have are multiple infrastructures that you can pick and choose as a menu, depending on the needs of your collection for how you how you store information. Our, our basic infrastructure are four geographically distributed SL8500 robotic libraries, uh, about 160 petabytes of capacity at the moment. And what we do is every evening, we check a whole bunch of the content based on the SHA values for fixity and the files. And we're constantly looking for media that's rotting. Um, uh, the data tapes, you know, they'll advertise they can be around for 50 years, but we've been measuring because we have tens of thousands of barium ferrite based tapes. They're LTO based at the moment before they used to be T10KD for those that are familiar with the data tape uh, technologies. But we would find anywhere in a given year from you know, six to 60 tapes that would age badly or go or go bad within the first three years. So what we do is every night we check all the files on a bunch of the tapes in in a, in, in each library. Um, if we find a data a file on a data tape that's bad, the library will load a new uh, tape up. Go check at for the at the twin at one of the other tape libraries. Everything's okay. Copy it onto a new tape and throw the bad tape in the garbage. Um, we also for two reasons, don't keep data on LTO or data tape more than three years. As soon as the tape hits three years old, we'll, audit, we'll check all of the SHA values, uh, copy it to a new tape, and then throw the three-year-old one away. That allows us to avoid the highest number of problems <clears throat> which occur on the barium ferrite tapes after three years, uh, as well as um, shrink the footprint uh, in terms of how much it takes to store the various petabytes of content uh, by updating to the latest, in this case, version of LTO. We're on LTO 9 now, which is an 18 terabyte native cartridge um, for storage. Uh, we've also has have our software so that it synchronizes with Microsoft Azure and AWS at the moment. It's uh, just an S3 interface for doing the, those, that synchronization through between the tape libraries and, and Azure's tape service or AWS Glacier. Um, 
And so someone who comes to us with a collection can say, I would like one copy on tape and one copy on Azure or one copy on AWS. And soon they can say one copy on Filecoin. Uh, and what we do is say we have um, for, uh, on the front of this, I mentioned we have Isilon systems, about 15 petabytes of them that are connected to the high performance supercomputer. And uh, we have, this is our base fee. I'll start going into numbers more a little bit later, but um, we calculated based on the lifespan of a, an LTO cartridge, you know, what, what, what the roadmap is for them being deployed. And the fact that the cartridges stay about the same price, even though you get more capacity every time they're deployed, we now are estimating for, you know, at a three-year rate, six copies and six migrations, uh, $800 one-time fee per terabyte for 20 years. So if we have a doctor that's got a two-year grant, they're getting $4 million, the end result is going to be 10 terabytes of data that they need to serve up as part of their data management plan. Um, we will charge, ask them to put $8,000 as a one-time fee in their grant and then supply them a service level agreement and a 20-year contract that they can also include in their grant um, that says you, we give them $8,000 and then the USC libraries guarantees this um, for 20 years. Um, we have a 20-year and a six-year agreement depending on the kind of data management plan somebody needs. Um, and you can get with that, you know, one copy on tape, one copy on another infrastructure. Each of the different infrastructures has various benefits. You know, Azure is much faster to copy things over, um, but the the tape is a little bit more um, uh, sturdy as a medium and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so that's our base infrastructure for digital preservation. Uh, I did mention we've got um, the high-speed disk uh, uh, connected on the front end. It's Dell Isilons. Um, it's an old picture. It says EMC. Uh, but this is our charging rate. And so we'll have someone like the Earthquake Center who would have like 400 terabytes of data. They'll process it, but they want to put 20 terabytes away to tape later on. They'll They'll rent space for a little bit on the high speed system. And then it'll be connected to our supercomputer at USC if they need it. Um, and then uh, they can either do use scratch base as a single copy at USC. Um, we also have at Clemson, not only all of our tape, but all of our servers and all of our storage mirrored in their data center. And if someone wants to really make sure they don't lose anything as they're processing it, we have mirrored synchronized Dell Isilons between USC and Clemson that they can use as well uh, when processing their data to be put away for preservation later. Um, security becomes a big part of this. Different collections have different security needs. Um, we, as a part of our service, uh, spend a lot of time being able to help people with audits for whatever kind of collection they send our way. Um, most of them are coming in as SOC 2 now, um, but uh, we will um, uh, alter uh, what's needed uh, to help people with whatever their audits are. And, there, and there's two kinds of audits. One, you know, one are the security audits, which are very specific, but then there's also a uh, content audit. So from a preservation perspective, if you have a tape that's damaged that you need to migrate off of. They want you, they want to sh show proof that you've migrated off of that. This is one of the benefits of having our tape libraries and our logs. We can show an audit of every time there was a damaged tape and that we migrated off of it and report on that. Um, you can't get that from AWS now. There's a new product coming out from Microsoft this year that'll allow you to do those aud audits called um, Azure uh, Tasks. Uh, and that's going to be a big deal because that'll be the first real vendor that'll let you do audits on any damaged content in their infrastructure and, and what you can do about it. 
these are some of the folks <clears throat> that are using the infrastructure at USC, uh, the digital repository at USC at the moment. Um, and just for anyone who's wondering who would be using these kinds of infrastructures, these are the groups that, that use them the most at USC. Um, again, all of them have service level agreements and are, are paying for the services uh, to the libraries. Um, and these are some of the external collections that have been brought in based on uh, things that people want to do with the digital repository. <clears throat> so that's sort of an overview of what we do. Um, now getting specifically into uh, the data management plan piece of this. Um, again, we, we are uh, looking at one year, six year and 20 year increments, depending on the kind of data management plan someone wants to put in place and how long they want to provide access to the content in their grants. Um, and so we've based our pricing off of the time, the advertised time frame of uh, LTO because the cartridge, while you can negotiate in volume, um, you basically can can kind of count on that cartridge costing the same, even though they put more capacity on it. Um, it used to be that we would be able to negotiate between Oracle, who had a, a barium ferrite tape called T10KD, and IBM, who still has one called JAG, but right now, really, LTO has sort of taken this over and, and sort of defines how you would model out your costs. And again, the idea is that if someone has a grant, the grant's not going to last as long as they need to provide access to the results of those grants uh, for their data, their data sets. Um, and so we will actually sign a contract as the library that they can include in their grants saying, we will guarantee the life of this, even though the grant will have ended over X period of time. Um, we also start to tailor some solutions. A lot of uh, people who've been coming to us with, with, with various collections, they can't just put them up to make the data sets freely available. They need to ch go through certain checks and balances before they release a data set. So they need it to be accessible, but they need to check who it is that's accessing it. So we've been supplying various solutions for workflows for researchers that need to check uh, um, who's asking, asking for access to their data before it is released. And so um, we, we are working hard to be compliant for all of the various data sets that come in. But what, one of the things we're finding is there's a lot of free resources out there for people to be able to store their data sets for data management plans if they're not too large. We're finding that the folks with more bespoke issues around the size of their data sets, the type of functionality of their data sets, um, and what, they, what they're putting away, or um, their act, they may have special access rules or the ones that come to us versus using maybe a lot of the open source uh, uh, um, options that are uh, available to them. And, and because they have sort of bespoke needs a lot of the time, we have to put these service level agreements in with the various researchers to uh, make sure that, if the, if that, that we're responding in a timely fashion to any of the needs they have. Um, and uh, just this is back to the various audit services that we have been um, supplying, but, you know, we also help with unique persistent identifiers, um, metadata, uh, QA, um, all of the various critical considerations that the NSF and NIH are asking for researchers to look at. We are a, a sort of an internal consulting group for the researchers to make sure that they're meeting all the different pieces that their particular program officers or programs may be pushing on them in these various areas. And then we're building it into the service level agreement and into their grants so they can ask for the money as needed. So that I went through that. I actually have a ton of, a, of, of slides with other kinds of data on it, but I thought what I would do is stop there for a bit and see where um, questions were coming in terms of what I uh, just talked about.
And yeah. Eric, do you want to help me figure out who we should be asking for stuff as we? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first off, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, typically folks uh, raise their hand to ask questions and also uh, please feel free everyone to type your questions up in the chat. Um, looks like Scott has his uh, hand raised right now. So um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Scott Prater, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I have a question. Um, I see this focus uh, mostly on um, data management, particularly for grants and for live work. Uh, is your system also uh, used for uh, permanent, long-term, or indefinite uh, digital preservation for uh, USC intellectual assets? And if so, is there a different cost model for that? Um, it actually primarily was built for USC intellectual assets, and it was built for the Shoah Foundation and 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 other collections first. And we we added the data management plan uh, effort on uh, afterwards. And so um, the the cost models around storage and are the same for this particular set of services for, for those collections. There are some internal budgets that cover the cost, but it helps with budgeting because we use the same menu of services to know how much any given collection is gonna cost that may come our way. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Andrew? Um, yeah, this is Andrew Diamond from AP Trust. You mentioned using Filecoin, and I was wondering um, if Filecoin provides any kind of guarantees for long-term durability, I guess would be the best word. Like if you uh, store some materials in with, using Filecoin, how do you know that they're still going to be there in five years? Yeah, so um, that's a really good uh, point. So what what we've um, done is we insist that anyone who puts a collection with us keeps one copy at, at a minimum on tape and in, in our tape infrastructure. And then another copy can be put on Filecoin or, uh, or, or Azure or any of the other services. So we don't trust anything other than our own infrastructure for long-term preservation. Um, if the other ones last, that's fantastic, but you will at a minimum have uh, inside the USC tape library infrastructure a copy if one of those services goes bad. So the primary reason to use Filecoin, um, although it's being used as a technical preservation alternative, is if you are tracking the um, the provenance of the content. So let's say you have a camera that gives you a Shaw value for the photograph you have, <clears throat> and it puts all the GPS data in, so you know it was taken. And you you know people are using this in Ukraine, and they're using it in court cases, going to ICC and stuff like that now, where you can show the where a picture was taken. You could show that it hasn't changed since that time. That same Shaw value can be used in the preservation system. But when it comes out the other end through some sort of Web3 service like Avalanche or something else that's mints it, you and you get a digital copy of that file, you can go look at the public blockchain and make sure that you have the exact copy of that file that you're that 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 is um uh, the proven version of that copy. Uh and that that's actually for court cases and things like that becoming a, a really important part. So uh, we, the people who are looking at Filecoin for us are not looking at it as an alternative to tape, but for um, the additional functions that you get from being in a Web3 environment added to the security you get from being having a tape archive in the middle. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that makes sense. And I had I had never even thought of that case, but that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Linda, I see a hand up. Hey, hi, Sam. Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentation. So I hope we can go into the weeds a little bit on LTO9 media, since you said you're sure, using Here we go. You betcha. So I'm wondering if you've, I know that this problem is not 
probably what you're experiencing because you're in a very controlled environment. But I have heard only in the last week that there's uh, that LTO9 media's the data tape seems to be environmentally sensitive. So, for example, so it appears from what I've learned from the manufacturers is that the substrate polymer is thinner in order so that they can get more tracks on it and have more data on it. But as a result of that, then um, the tape then can expand or contract. If then you write a tape, you calibrate the tape, and the, which is the first time you have to do it for LTO9. This yep. time you had to, didn't have to do it for previous LTO generations. You have to calibrate in your environment. But then if that tape, after you write the data to it, somebody takes that tape and they're in a different environment. I'm talking about temperature and humidity. It's hotter, it's more humid, it's colder, it's drier, whatever. They will, will have difficulties reading the data off the tape. And yeah, so, so yeah. What, what's you, your experience with that? Yeah, so let me tell you, we, we have tens of thousands of tapes that we just feed into our tape libraries. And we aggressively don't try and keep, we don't keep a tape more than three years um, to avoid all of these kinds of problems that you're talking about. Every new generation of tape seems to have a problem. And if you're going to keep a tape for 30 to 50 years, you're going to get to experience all those problems. But what we do is we don't keep a tape more than three years. We, we're going to buy LTO 10 as soon as it's available. And as tapes start to age out after three years, we're going to copy. We'll check all the Shaw values on that LTO 9, copy all the content over to the LTO 10, and throw away the LTO 9. So we don't keep older tapes. Um one of the things that we found in general with the barium ferrite tapes over time is when you have sensitivities like the one you're talking about, they usually don't show up until after three or four years. So, so doing the cutoff at three years is great, but we still, you know, every 10,000 tapes, uh, it, if they're doing well, we will, will detect six that are bad, but if they're not doing well, we can get over 60 tapes that that are bad in the first three years well the situation with lto9 is um, i mean because we've worked with older generations lto and there's been no problem at all but it appears that with lto10 when it comes out is they're going to have it on a different polymer stock and they will be using strontium ferrite instead of barium ferrite which will hopefully make it more stable that's when it that is what is in 3592 je that yep. was just released last month but the thing is is like it isn't like people are waiting three years to find this problem with lto9 i was speaking to people who they're receiving lto9s that were written in egypt very hot very humid they yeah. get the tapes here in Burbank and they can't read all the data off because the yeah. tape well, has Well, let me now tell you, we are checking the tapes every... So again, we, we have controlled data centers. We get the data. We, we, we put them into our tape libraries. Everything's kept online. We don't take anything out of our tape libraries. So the, the, we, we don't have that particular scenario you have where someone is shipping around data tapes. Um, uh, our data tapes go straight in the tape libraries, they get written to, and then they get checked at a minimum once every six months for all the Shaw values to see if there's any errors. The minute we find even one file that's got an error, we just load a brand new tape up, uh, uh, go to one of the tapes and, you know, let's say they have three copies um, or, or multiple copies, we'll go to one of the other copies, check it, make sure it's okay copy it to the new tape and then throw the one that's having stress related issues in the garbage. We throw out or, or recycle a, a lot of tape uh, because of that. And every, I expect with the LTO, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the tape libraries with the LTO 10, but we'll keep to the same six month checks to make sure everything's okay. And no longer than three years before it goes it gets migrated off of to the next the next copy. I don't know if I addressed your your particular problem, but that's because the one that you're talking about, people are using it to transport data around. We just use it as the actual storage in our distributed tape libraries around the world. Right. That's why I think in your situation, when, when I started, I, it's not really relevant because if you're using it on the same environment, which it was written is okay. It's more of a problem like for preservation purposes, for ongoing, for other folks. 
uh, who might needing might yeah. need to share or provide data somewhere else, this could be an issue. Yeah, I, I wouldn't suggest that. And um, it's not what we follow. You know, we when we get data, we keep it uh, distributed and online and checkable on a regular basis. Uh, and, and again, you get the multiple copies currently today based on the pricing at 800 terabytes for 20 years. Uh, I'm sorry, at $800, get one time fee, gets you a terabyte for 20 years at the moment. Okay, we've got um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat here. Uh, oh, one from Z, and apologize if there's a, an echo here. Um, but Zeke is asking, uh, does this, uh, the USC offering for research data sets include public access for download at the same price? Uh, yes, but we offer different levels. We have sort of like a basic public access where people can get to the data, but we also have digital asset management systems, depending on the complexity of the data that we offer up for additional uh, uh, prices, depending on the nature of your data and the complexity and the kind of digital asset management system you need. We host di digital libraries and digital asset management systems for some of our customers. So it's directly connected to the data and, or, or we have generic ones that we run that someone will just say, can we use yours uh, that we would run with their data? So sort of depends on the level, but there is a free version or, or it comes with the preservation. And then there's, but there's levels of complexity depending on what you need to do with your data. And most of the people who come to us want need a new uh, additional complexity to what happens with their access. Okay, and then um, Sybil mentions- um, Yeah, two I is the minimum, so, Sybil, and okay. we suggest three copies to people, um, but we, and oftentimes we'll keep three or four, but two is a minimum. So we say keep a tape copy and then you can have one other copy on tape or or Filecoin or uh, in Azure. And um, uh, uh, if you want, we'll talk, if you want more than two, we'll we'll keep three or four. It sort of depends on the person in their collection and, and their, their appetite for having more copies. Uh, for the Shoah Foundation, which uh, I, I'm, I'm doing, I, I currently have four tape copies and then, you know, I, I, we're, we're, one, we're one of the experimental ones in Filecoin. We've got a Filecoin copy and an Azure copy as well there, just keeping them synchronized and looking at it. And that's a six petabyte database. Did I hope that answered your question. Okay, Sybil. Um, and and also, you know, as a digital repository, um, we we are a backup for other universities, other organizations, um, uh, repositories as well. Um, like I said, we have this partnership with Clemson, but we have others that just ask to target our digital repository for their repositories. Um, and uh, we're always interested in talking to other universities that want to do you know, more diversification because we think preservation diversification is key. More geographies, more organizations, more technology. So, you know, sort of the, the tri, the, the ultimate combo would be you, three different technologies like and three different locations and then three different types of organizations like a, we would be a nonprofit cloud but you do a for profit cloud like azure and then possibly even a governmental cloud like for the shoah foundation we're going to be keeping a copy at the national library of israel yes hillary hi thanks for your presentation i was curious if there's been kind of like environmental sustainability conversations um for the repositories practice because that's like one of our charges does it yeah. consider that? Yeah, there's there's two things there. Um, well, there's a lot of things around environmental. So, so the top level answer is yes. I'll go through a few of those. So tape, because it sits in a tape library and all you have to do is power up the drives, the cost in the data center for using tape libraries over anything that's constantly online um, otherwise is 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 huge. It's just a big difference in heat, 
uh, and, and everything else. Cause you're basically just putting the tapes on a shelf and you've got a dozen robot arms or 20 robot arms that just need to be powered up and, and uh, going off and getting stuff. So tape is a really green way. If you compare it to some of the other data centers of storing content, the issue is, is we, <clears throat> for preservation, anything that's on data tape that you want access to, it could take a day to be able to get it. Um, and uh, so that's why some people will have like access, higher speed access versions available if something's getting access often. Um, but the other thing you start to see with Web3, um, we, you know, we were looking at there's, 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 uh, uh, proof of work versus um, uh, proof of stake uh, algorithms where the money, you know, Bitcoin and um, Ethereum and those things, they use the algorithms where you constantly have to do math to show that you've got the original file. Whereas in the proof of stake stuff that Filecoin does, we, we have to, we have 20 petabytes on Filecoin that costs about, um, we added a grant gift, but it costs uh, uh, about a million dollars to be able to put the stake up so that if there's an error when someone accesses it from you, it takes away from your coins. So there's actually um, a charge to that, but it becomes much greener because you don't have people constantly doing math to prove that they've gotten the right set of files. They just take money away from the people who are offering those files if they do it wrong. And that that ends up saving a bunch of money and then we've started looking at, you know, we have some AI and other stuff that's going in there. And those are very expensive algorithms. Um, I And we've started looking a little bit at quantum computing and other things, which very much will lower the amount of, of um, computing resource needed to do a lot of the fixity cryptographic algorithms used in our archives and other things. And I think that there's a lot of promise for green stuff there. Um, uh, uh, happy to talk more about green. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, well, sustainability, really. It, it's a very big thing with data. And part of it is, you know, not offering your data up faster than it needs to be offered up based on whatever the personas and use cases are for those that are accessing it. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. So I, okay. I'm just going to go back. So again, if you have any questions about our service or want to talk to us, is our website. So Sam, um, you had mentioned acting, spending a decent amount of time or a significant amount of time acting as um, kind of in a, a, con, a consulting role to um, the different researchers that are making use of the system. And um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the common themes or just um, common practices that were primary practices that were put into place when it comes to working with clinical data or security, you know, having the appropriate amount of security that might be required um, by the NIH or the data management plan. Um, and like, yeah, what are some of those like areas that you find yourself touching on with the researchers um, in terms of access? So for the researchers, it's, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. They're like being forced into this almost. So you, you, you want to try and make this as easy as possible as an experience for them. Um, and so, but they know that the audits are important. They know all of these different pieces are important. So we actually have an information security officer that's in our group just for the repository, looking at these kinds of, of issues to help people with whatever their various auditing issues are gonna be. Um, you, you wanna do the big general ones like SOC 2, type one, et cetera, so that you can say your infrastructure is secure, but then each different, researcher may come at you and um, it really gets tricky if they start to have data, uh, personal data that's not freely accessible. So we've been talking about the freely accessible data, but when 
things can't aren't freely accessible, you get a whole nother level of auditing and security to prove that you haven't made the data as freely accessible as it should be because there's IRB issues or whatever the other kind of problem is that somebody may be dealing with in in, in their data set. So, you know, we're we're their library. So we're there to preserve, help store and help provide access to these academic data sets. And we want to make them freely available when they can be. Um, and when we provide all the generic audits that are needed for the freely available content. But when it can't be freely available, that's really where the, a lot of the consulting comes into place. What 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 has to be tuned to make sure that everybody, including the people whose data may be in the sets, is safe? Got it. And so, at the just as a follow up, at the the end of like say a one period, a one year time period, or the six year time period, or the twenty um, year, twenty years, the or, most popular. Or, okay, or and the twenty. Um, do you find people coming to you or, or do you think you might find people coming to you saying, well, what are my egress options? Like, I still want this data. I want to keep it in a separate location. Are you able to help them like get the data out and transfer it? Or do you have provide options in terms of egress? Yeah. So today, if someone needs to get it, we help them get it wherever they need to get it uh, to. Um, in the future, let's say someone's had something around for a while, it's 20 years later. There may not be anyone there who to talk to, and so it would go with through the library's regular collections policy on 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 whether content is kept and how it's kept. Got it. Understood. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Let's see. Just want to. Go ahead and ask again if uh, other folks have questions. Scott had, uh, do we have explicit succession agreements for abandoned data? Again, we're, we're the libraries and these are re you know researchers that are submitting their content to the library. Um, we'll look at it at the end if there's, if it's abandoned on um, whether it just gets deleted or whether it's something worth cataloging and the library using its own internal funds to uh, continue to provide access to. So we don't have explicit succession agreements. We say we are going to all have a conversation about this data in 20 years. Scott, you raised your hand again. Yeah, I just have a quick follow-up uh, on that. Uh, do you ever have the use case where a researcher says, I'm going someplace else and I want to take my data with me and leave? Yeah, if we do, we give them their data and they can go. Okay, I see. And so you do delete the data then it's... Uh, they don't get a refund or anything like that. No, we wouldn't give them a refund, but let, let's say they put in eight thousand. You know, if it's a it's a doctor that's been on a larger grant and they put eight thousand dollars in for their data management plan and preservation, we're not going to give them forty five hundred dollars of that eight thousand dollars back or whatever it is. Okay, thank you. But it, it's too small a number, I think, for for anyone to have bothered us yet, for the folks that would use the service. So I, I'm starting to think about um, the mention of, or the whole configuration of the system um, with regard to the supercomputer that you have at USC and making use of that. Um, you know, when data set, as data sets become larger and larger, um, the pipeline between the storage and the supercomputer or any other facilities or, or mechanisms that, that are being used for modeling or, or analysis or anything like that, they have to, they have to accommodate that sort of throughput. And so I'm curious about, um, how you all have addressed, uh, you know, the data sets becoming larger, or if you've seen any major bottlenecks that you're trying to address between the supercomputer and the storage, or maybe even like access, like trying to get that data to a different, um, different facility for processing uh, in addition to the supercomputer, that sort of thing. Yeah. So there are, there, there are no bottlenecks yet. We've got multiple hundred gigabit connections out of USC to the clouds and to and to other locations. But one of the things we've done with our storage is like the deal that we have with the vendor 
who's supplying our storage for, we, we have about a quarter of our storage. We have that high speed disk. So I was saying we have about 60 petabytes we're managing, but we've got 15 of high speed. We, we don't keep that. We, we didn't buy 15 petabytes and then some of it's full and some of it's not. What, what the deal is that we put in place because they, they will start to at a certain level treat you like a cloud vendor is that we put in, uh, they'll put in a 250 terabyte node that is that has no data on it and they do that for free. And the minute your data goes over a certain level, um, they'll start using that node and then they send you a bill. And so we actually started at around three petabytes and the use of that high speed storage has just grown and grown and grown. And we keep activating new nodes. Um, and then we'll do a refresh on all the nodes and we've never needed to shrink. We just, it the nodes themselves just keep growing. So you have to not only look at your, your, what you supply, but but how you your relationship with your hardware vendor and how you allow it to grow. Right, right. Yeah, I guess ideally it would be nice to like recoup some of that or just like spin down some of the nodes if possible, right? But but no, yeah, well, just people keep using it. We would spin it down. Like let's say all of a sudden no one wanted to use our 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 high speed structure anymore and we only had seven petabytes of storage on it. When we refreshed, we would only we wouldn't refresh the rest of it. We would shrink, but all we've done is grow. Yeah, yeah. And and so, what what is the actual like the the refresh cycle? Is this um like what? Yeah, I'm just trying to envision what what that about looks like. About every three around. years, also for the hardware, three to four years. Okay, okay, got it, got it. I understand. All right, um, so let's see, any last call for questions here? We're kind of running up against the hour. Right. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah, thank you, thank you so much. much for agreeing. <laughs> yeah, this has been great. Um, we, um, Let's see, I just wanted to mention, uh, we haven't taken a lot of notes during this conversation, but as Sam mentioned, a lot of this information is up on their website. Um, we will, we have been recording this uh, session, so um, we will make the effort to post the recording up on our YouTube channel. We need to catch up on that. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Sam, for presenting and thanks everyone for their questions. Um, a quick reminder that uh, the, uh, NDSA DigiPres conference is coming up, um, as well as the DLF forum and all their activities associated with that in um, November. So um, the registration is open for that, and there's lots of information up online. Um, our next planned infrastructure interest group meeting is for December 4th, um, and we have other topics that uh, folks have um, voted up on our poll for uh, of interest, so we will take a look at those. Um, but uh, again, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it was great to see you and um, we'll look forward to seeing you in December. All right. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Yeah, bye-bye.